Hello, and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast where two brothers will answer your questions, give you abuse advice, and give you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. John, what is the elephant in the room? I mean, I'm sure we're going to have the same elephant in the room this week, but we'll, we'll give it a go anyway. Three, all right. two, one, the Justice World Kennedy. Cup. <laughs> No, we did just find out that Justice Kennedy is retiring, which is a bummer. But the important news of the week, mm. by far, I mean, a bummer. I, I, don't even, I don't even know how to talk about the Supreme Court right now, Hank. So I'm not going to try. Instead, I'm going to talk about <laughs> the amazing drama of the World Cup. Uh, this, this weird timeline in which we find ourselves in the multiverse, Hank, where uh, so many things are not great. But sports just continues to deliver. A Chicago Cubs World Series, AFC Wimbledon promoted to the third tier of English football, Liverpool oh so close to a Champions League victory, and then this year's World Cup is just, it is the best World Cup of my lifetime by a wide margin, despite the fact that my home nation is not even involved in it. The drama is incredible. I almost barfed a couple hours ago watching the World Cup. That's how stressful and exciting it was. I gotta tell you, John, on my Twitter feed, most of the news uh, today has been about like Slack being down. Uh, I'm not. I haven't. I haven't caught a great deal of World Cup news except something to do with Germany not being in the World Cup anymore. That's right. Germany failed to qualify for the knockout rounds. Uh, Sheridan, mm. who helps produce this podcast, huge fan of the German national team, absolutely devastated. On the other hand, uh, my loyalty is is split because the pride of North America, Mexico, qualified only because Germany didn't. Ah. So, uh, so I, I I have to confess that I was excited about that. Excited for Rosiana, and also excited for North America. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there, you know, thirty one teams are going to lose the World Cup this year, Hank. That's um, right. And they all did better than America. That's right, and they can go home feeling good about that. So, is Mexico in the knock? Did they qualify the, for the knockout rounds, or did they? Are That's they just right. moving up? Nope, they're in the round of sixteen. Oh. In fact, by the time this pod gets uploaded, they may be out of the World Cup. It, <laughs> okay, it happens so, they so have fast. To play, they have to play a game to see if they get to the next round. Well, now it's now it's the knockout round, so called, oh. because every game is win or go home. Oh, I thought the knockout round was like uh, sometimes in in some sports you have a time when it's like the 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 people who didn't do well get to play each other to stay in the tournament no no we don't have that no that's not a thing okay so it's the knockout there is a round. third place game okay. if you make it to the semifinals, you get to play to figure out who finishes third it's the bummerest game mm-hmm. in the world cup every mm-hmm. year mm-hmm. but anyway hank uh let's not talk about football or the supreme court let's answer some questions from our listeners john if there was any sport before we get to questions from our listeners if there was any sport that you could have be as big a deal as soccer that yep. isn't currently as big a deal as soccer. What sport would yep. that be? Um, can I pick soccer in the United States? No, no, I'm, okay. no that's right, not me, that's let, not in the spirit me, of the question, John. Let me come up with it. Let me come up with an answer. <laughs> I think it would be amazing if the entire world were captivated every four years by a team handball global tournament. Uh. <laughs> Handball of all the things. I just think it would what be amazing, that? or possibly table tennis. Yeah, if table tennis is just really like, good. What about if that there was game, a Wimbledon of table tennis? What about that game where they, that they play in somewhere where it's like volleyball, but you have to use your feet? You can't use oh, your yeah. hands. Yeah, foot volleyball. I think that's the technical term for it. That's good. That would be really good. I actually, you know, I, I played like the only game that I, except for hockey, that I ever played with any amount of gusto was ultimate frisbee. And Me too. I, I feel like why not? Why not the World Cup of Ultimate Frisbee? Indeed, I think that professional Ultimate Frisbee is incredible. The talk about drama. I mean, what? It's a heck of a good sport. The way I played it in high school, not quite as beautiful, but yeah. still, there are so many great sports out there that don't get the attention that they deserve. What about uh, like robotics? You know, like those mm, those robot high wars. school robotics teams. Robot I would wars. love to see that in the Olympics. Is there an Olympic? <laughs> Is there a sport, Hank, in yeah. which either current you or some past version of you would have had a legitimate chance of making it to the Olympics? Uh, like video blogging, maybe? Mm, I don't think so. It's I don't really mean all to be I rude. Got. Maybe 2008 you could have made it to the Olympics in video blogging, maybe. Right, right, because there just, just wasn't because- a lot of competition. Right, the mm-hmm. American t- the American bench was pretty weak, but <laughs> I don't Nowadays, know. I think not so much. 
Yeah, sometimes I think like, am I good enough? Because like, ooh, we, we, ooh, ooh, I have it. I could be. Okay. I could co- totally go to the World Cup for singing fast about science. Oh, that's very yes. That's good. That's good. I'm. Uh, I'm. In, I'm definitely in the top. And because just because there's, uh, as we say, not a huge pool. Right. It's important to be. Uh, my friend Amy Cross Rosenthal told me once that it, more than being important to excel at something, it's important to excel at something extremely specific. And I find that to be really <laughs> deeply true it's super advice. True. It's super right, true. Let's answer some questions from our listeners. This one comes from Josh, who writes, Dear John and Hank, after getting the chance to live with my sister for a few years in our mid-20s, we've become very close. This is a great gift because we didn't have the best relationship growing up. This past year, I got engaged and purchased a house, which has led to less contact and communication with my sister. Most of our recent communications has become sharing YouTube videos with each other. While I should be happy that we have a good relationship and enjoy the same things, like any older sibling, I'm more concerned about who should get credit for discovering those videos. Is the discoverer of new content the person who views it first or the person who shares it first? <laughs> Whoever's wrong has to buy the other copy of An Absolutely Remarkable Things, which comes out September 25th and is available for pre-order now. Just meing around, Josh. P.S. The wedding is on March 17th, just north of Boston, and you are both invited. Hank, I took the liberty of going to Josh's wedding website he didn't mm. give us that much information, but he did give us enough information because Google is creepy for me to find the, his wedding website where he's wearing a um, We're the Exception Mongols Crash Course t-shirt. Oh. Thank you for supporting us over at DFTBA.com, Josh. The, but the, the relevant thing here, Hank, before we get to the question, is that on their website, there's a big button that says menu, and then it says our wedding, and then underneath that it says details. And I went to details, of course, because I want to know, like, you know, where is the wedding can I realistically go, etc.? I click details. There is nothing. There's hmm. there's nothing under the details menu, Hank. And then there's no photos under the photos thing. And then they don't even have a registry up. Josh, for the love of God, get your registry on the internet, man. I wanted to yeah, buy you a gravy gonna, boat. Yeah, if you're going to send your wedding information to a, a, a famous author who might want to buy you a crock pot or something, you got to have that up there. I mean, uh, do you you want me to like bookmark the page and keep visiting every day until you update (laughs) your registry? Because I will if necessary, Josh. Put some details uh, on your, the details tab of your wedding is, website. Uh, how did this question, this this fine question about asking who gets the credit for discovering a video devolve into you criticizing someone's wedding website, which clearly is not the most important website on the internet? I mean, it's the most important website related to Josh's wedding on the internet. That's true. That's true. And and it is. It does. It does make me feel a little bit like I don't have a ton of faith that they're going to put on the the most sort of like well run, uh, well, like well, to, clockwork wedding. To be fair, their wedding is not for two hundred sixty three days. It is a while from now. Yeah, that's true. It is a while from now. John, do you have any examples of like a YouTube video that you feel like you you found before everyone and you were like, this is going to be big and then it became big? Yes. The History of Japan bi- video by Bill Wirtz. Ah, yes. I saw when it had yes. like fewer than 10,000 views and I, I watched it and I sent it to Sarah and Sarah was like, this is great. And when Sarah likes a YouTube video, I know it's going to be real big. <laughs> I once watched. I, I fairly recently watched a video that I said uh, I tweeted, and I said this is gonna this is gonna be huge, and then it wasn't. Oh, really? Which which is pretty regular for me, actually. I I tend to think that uh, that it's easier to go viral than it actually is, John. Yes, it is not that easy to go viral, especially now. Uh, the internet now contains. I don't know if you've noticed this. A lot of videos. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, and to Indeed. really go, but it, occasionally to, you see something and you're like, "This is this is going to do it," and then it actually does, and that always feels good uh, when you when you tweet it early. And and, and I think that there is some uh, there is some cred that you get for that, some status you could sort of achieve when it's like, "I am I was a I don't know." Should you though? Because you didn't make the video, and also like it wasn't you that made it go viral, right? But you know, there is something that feels good about being like among the first one thousand subscribers to a new YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Or the first 1,000 people to see a video that ends up going huge or listening to somebody's mixtape before they, you know, blow up or whatever. There is something fun about that. That said, the person who gets credit for the video is the person who shares it, not the person who sees it. Yeah, absolutely. You got to do the share. 
Yeah. It, because because otherwise you could just be lying. Like you're gonna like go show me your like a screenshot of your YouTube history. You might be just editing editing the HTML. I can't believe you. I don't have any reason to trust you, Josh. Also on the 2018 internet, if it didn't get shared, it literally didn't happen. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Shares shares or it didn't happen. I uh, I can't trust anything anymore. So if I didn't see if I didn't see an email from Josh, then then I I trust I trust no one. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't even, I, I, oh God, I, Hank, how did we get, how did we get to this dark timeline? Sorry, what's the next question? This next question comes from Alex, John. It says, hey, Hank and John, <laughs> that's what it says. Starts out Not super dear, casual. Just, hi. Hey. Yeah, super cash, super hey. cash. Alex says, I say like a lot, as do my friends, as do you guys. It's true, we do say like, uh, but whenever I go home, my mom makes like a big deal of it. Some... It doesn't say like, I just inserted a like because that's what I do. Sometimes stopping the conversation whenever I say like, I never notice it until she points it out and now I really listen to what I say. Is it just a normal part of our language now? Do you notice yourself doing it all the time? Pumpkins and penguins, Alex. Your mom's just harshing your buzz, man. Yeah, she's I mean, harshing on your it? yums, Yuck. buddy. Just, yeah, harshing on your yums. It's not cool. Here's not the cool. thing about like, if you don't say like, you either say said constantly right or you don't have those weird pauses in your speech which i think makes your speech sound more weird at least to me like there's a reason we say like and it's to create a pause it's to create a moment for us to think but also to create a moment between whatever we just said and what mm -hmm. we're like about to say and then the other right. way you use like is when you say like that like the person was like i'm so tired and then the other person was mm -hmm. like i'm also tired post vidcon and then a third person was like well i'm tired of trying to brave uh the onslaught of horrors that i see <laughs> from the social internet and i'm disgusted and despondent with the state of discourse in the united states and those people right. didn't maybe literally say those things. And that's why you say like is because you're not actually quoting someone. You're trying mm -hmm. to deliver the content of what they said or at least of what you heard. So I, I actually think that like plays a good role in our language. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely there are times when I listen to someone talk and I think to myself, that's too many likes. Sure. Um, but but I I use it as an um. I also um. And we're professional talkers on this podcast. Mm, if we semi -pro. are doing it, semi pro, se semi professional talkers. If we're doing it and people are okay with it, I think it's probably okay at this point. So you can tell your mom that instead of saying like you are not going to say shirk all the time, and she's going to have to deal with that, and you and you'll be you'll be shirk, mom. I am just going to say shirk all the time now. Right. Nobody wants to hear. And then she was shirk. I can't believe Germany didn't qualify for the knockout round. <laughs> okay. Well, if you can't tell right now, I am very sleepy. Yeah. Ditto. <laughs> I apologize for a little bit of slurriness in my vocal patterns. And, and uh, if you could see me, you, you would be like, that guy needs some rest. And you'd be right. Yeah, all right, our next question comes right. from Tomomi who asks, Dear John and Hank, after so many times that I've had deadlines for papers at 11.59 p.m., I've started to wonder, how did people live without being able to check the time so easily? How did people tell time before clocks? When you wanted to meet someone, did you just wait around all day or hope you randomly bumped into them at some point? Also, it would be a cool challenge to try to go the whole day without checking the time in a place without mm. much sunshine. It's time to get an absolutely remarkable thing to Momi. <laughs> uh, John, yeah. when I read this question, I thought to myself, here's the thought I had. How do you turn in a paper at 11.59 p.m.? <laughs> I also had that thought. I was like, are you like rushing across <laughs> campus? And then I realized, yeah. oh, right. Oh, You're right. emailing yes, it. emailing it. Or, when, we, when we turned in papers, when we went to school, we handed them to the professor on the day they were due when the class happened. Absolutely. 100%. With, with our hands. It was due at the beginning of class. Occasionally, things would be due at 11.59 p.m., I guess. But usually no. only when I was turning them in late. 
Right. I, I never remember doing anything at 11. And also, this is sort of like, it's hilarious to me that, that a professor is like sitting there at their desk being like, it's 11.58, to about to get a bunch of papers all at once. <laughs> also, Like you've literally waited to the last minute. Literally. Right. Come I feel, on. I feel like nothing inspires a lack of confidence in a professor quite like reading a paper that was turned in at 11.59 p.m. in 42 seconds, you know? Like, yeah. What that yeah. screams to me is, I was not prepared. <laughs> it, it, this is not done, is what it says to me. <laughs> it's, it says, this is as close as I could get. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, what did people <laughs> anyway. do before? Well, that's an interesting question. So in a lot of places, there still isn't the same time obsession that we have in here in the United States. And we didn't have it in most of the world or any of the world, really, before the Industrial Revolution, when people started clocking in to work, when there started to be a lot of workers who were no longer agricultural workers, whose days weren't determined by, um, you know, by sunshine, mm -hmm. but instead by... Uh, by hours. So I think that was kind of the beginning of, of the change. But in lots of places in the world, you still see time dealt with differently. Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, that means you have an appointment for the afternoon, and you don't know exactly when in the afternoon it will be. Uh, the like obsession with minute by minute punctuality is definitely not a global phenomenon, but it is mm -hmm. a big part of my personal life. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely more efficient, and I think that like the, the the industrial revolution had a strong focus on understanding efficiency as a thing, like even understanding that 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 is is a thing, and also understanding that it's a, sort of a virtue. And sort of, I also like it. Sort of r is remarkable to me to think that like. I, I am not actually a slave to the clock and I feel a little bit as if I am because of course like my meetings start usually on the hour and then go for a half an hour or 50 minutes or something and so I I, I am paying attention all the time to that thing but but with if when that thing goes away you are still you still have to do the work and so what did how do people like decide when they had to get up it wasn't like oh it's 6 a.m i have to get up bah, 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 noise it was like the work's not gonna get done and then right. i'm gonna be hungry right. or not get paid or not get like n like my my family will not be taken care of right i do sometimes wish that i were not as clock focused as I am. Mm -hmm. And even when I was mm -hmm. a kid, I, re I remember looking at the clock much less because I didn't own a watch and obviously there were no smartphones. And so, you know, lots of times I wouldn't know what time it is. Uh, these days I can usually, at least during the day, tell you what time it is within 10 minutes just by thinking without looking at a clock. And that's a little distressing to me. Because yeah. you're right that the Industrial Revolution put a great emphasis on efficiency and the value of efficiency, but also, in a way, it created this idea that our lives exist to run efficiently and to, like, fill needs in marketplaces. And mm -hmm. it's a little disturbing to me because sometimes I wonder, does the market exist to make people better or do people only exist to make the markets more efficient and then the last thing i will add i'm not going to add anything to that particular line of thinking but there was a time when clocks had to be quite large and so you could have like a big one in your house but you certainly weren't going to get one on your wrist and during that period of time it was like well how are we going to have everybody know sort of roughly what time it is uh, and if you're going to try to solve that problem one way to do it would be to uh, build a very large clock that you could see from far away and or ring a bell at every hour for the number of like, and, and like ring four bells if it's four o'clock, which is why that happens. And it's sort of weird to think like, this is just a thing that happens. We don't need this. We continue to do it. But at one point it was a very important part of uh, like everybody with being on the same page, basically. There's a clock tower by my house that rings on the hour, and I still love that. And it reminds me of when I was in college, you were not considered late until the clock tower mm. had banged for the last time. So if it was right. 11 and you got there before the 11th bing, you were on time. I loved and that. And then one o'clock, it, it starts to get a lot more tight. Exactly. I tried to schedule all my classes <laughs> for 11 to save that six seconds because I'm so time obsessed. 
This next question comes from Kim, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I live in southern Florida, and the trail near my house that I use for exercise borders a wetland preserve. I've seen alligators along this stretch while driving, and I've had to go around poisonous snakes on the sidewalk while biking. As a native Floridian, I understand that these animals would like to avoid me as much as I would like to avoid them, and how to keep a respectful distance. However, there is a definite level of vigilance that is absent when I exercise elsewhere. My question is, does this primal fear help me burn more calories or otherwise improve my workout reptiles and rollerblades kim if there's actually rollerblades involved you really should have led with that because the idea of you like jumping and skating around a bunch of like coral snakes just really makes my day right uh i'm also seeing you like do a do a jump off the back of an alligator like it's a ramp and (laughs) i'm just liking this I feel like, Kim, maybe you should have uh, some kind of 90s animated uh, 15 or 11 minute video, uh, TV series. That would be great. Yeah. I'm here for that. I Absolutely. I also think that yeah, in general, anything that motivates you to, to ride your bike faster is good. And uh, the fear of death probably is providing that. I think you definitely get an adrenaline boost from that. Like I've run and barely missed a snake before, like with my footfall. Oh, really? And yeah. for like five minutes after that, I was definitely running faster. Now, I don't know mm. that it increased my overall time because for like right. the five minutes after that, I was running slower because I was tired. But I do think that getting an adrenaline boost, it can not hurt. So I would say get as close to those alligators as you can. I mean, actually, right. like encourage them to bite because that's going to be a big adrenaline boost. Yeah, you got to get hungry alligators, not just alligators. That's right. Or, or your family, you could be like, "Hey, y'all, if you could go and like lay down some fake snakes mm. on my on my rollerblading route, At- I won't know the difference uh, because I, I won't know for sure if they're real or not. But make sure you you don't think don't think like, oh, these are probably fake because they might not be. They might be real. You don't know which ones are fake and which ones are real, and you don't want to r- skate over one of them and suddenly have it detached like stuck in your wheels wiggling around wobbling around covered in in scales and teeth if you've ever wondered what hank is like when he's really tired you just heard it (laughs) oh man i'm so tired my body's very confused i took a nap at 9 a.m today it was not long enough i should have napped more This next question comes from Brent, who asks, Dear Hank and John, I have a dilemma. I'm an artist in high school, and I recently opened commissions where I draw people or their pets for money. Shortly after I posted that my commissions were open, I got messages from two different people who are interested, but these people are dating each other as it's their one-year anniversary soon, and they each want a drawing of them together to give to the other person. This is an issue. I can't exactly tell either of them because it's a gift, but I don't want to have them both pay for the same thing. That feels like a scam. Helps. It's no not the same thing. Specific... What? It's not the same thing. You got to make two different artworks, two yeah, vastly art different twice. artworks. Two arts. Yes. Make two arts. I... You got paid to do two arts, do two arts, and then it's super adorable because then they both get an art that's different but it's from the same artist because they that's so cute yeah you got to do it i would propose though that you do two vastly different arts so in one of the drawings you have like the couple at hogwarts and he's a mm. gryffindor mm-hmm. and she's a ravenclaw and they're mm-hmm. riding their brooms playing quidditch against each other and then in the other one it's like 1972 in los angeles and they're just learning yeah. about how to skateboard yeah, yeah. Sure, that. Those both sound great. I was I was still stuck in Florida and snakes and just covered in snakes, but that's way less good than than learning how to skateboard in the seventies in Los Angeles. That sounds awesome. I have a romantic the, I have a romantic gift for you. It's super romantic. It's um a picture of the two of us covered in snakes. <laughs> A picture of the two of us at the World Cup of Ultimate Frisbee. (laughs) Which reminds me that today's podcast is brought to you by the World Cup of Ultimate Frisbee. (laughs) The World Cup of Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, Just, you will not believe the Frisbee catches involved. Ultimate Frisbee extravaganza. This podcast is also brought to you by the word shirk. Uh, That's what you say instead of like, always from now on, just to make your mom know that she's being a pill. And today's podcast is also brought to you by 11.59 p.m., 11.59 p.m., (laughs) a non-ideal time to turn in your paper. And finally, this podcast is brought to you by incomplete wedding websites. Come on, Josh. (laughs) 
Get with it, Josh. Come on. There's only 259 days left to go. Only 259 days left to go. This podcast is also brought to you by our actual sponsor, Audible. Thank you, Audible. Audible. Thank the Lord for Audible. Oh, man. For, both because you're being sponsors and, and also because when I have a, I'm having a hard time sleeping because I might be stressed out about an event that's going on at the moment, even though it's going very well, I still need a, a little bit of somebody talking in my ears about space, uh, space exploration or about... Um, fantasy London in in eighteen twenty like anything uh, will put, help really helps put me to sleep and also helps me uh, hear some great stories. Audible is where you go for all kinds of audio entertainment and right now if you go to audible.com slash dear Hank or if you text dear Hank to five hundred five hundred you'll get a thirty day free trial. Your first audiobook is a free. Uh, and among the free audiobooks that you can get. Uh, are my mm. books, The Fault in Our Stars yeah. or Paper Towns or Turtles All the Way Down or Looking for Alaska or the other one that no one reads. Uh, you can get all of those. Uh, <laughs> really high quality audiobooks. Uh, I love the narrators for all of my books. I feel so lucky to have had such great narrators. And uh, you can get any of them for free or any other book you want. You can also pre-order an absolutely remarkable thing on Audible. That's audible.com slash dear John. That's my recommended URL. Audible.com slash dear John. Or uh, you can send a text message to 500, 500 that just reads dear John and sign up, get a 30 day free trial and your first audiobook free. Audible really is a, an amazing, amazing service. I love listening to audiobooks. Hank, I don't know if you're listening to anything right now, but I just love I am. audiobooks so much. I'm listening to two right now. I'm re listening to two because one of them is a scary book, so I don't like to listen to it when I'm going to sleep. It's called Slade House. Mm. It's by David Mitchell. It's really interesting and good, but when I'm, it's dark in my room and I have my headphones in and I'm staring at my nightstand without being able to close my eyes because it's so creepy and cool, uh, I don't like that. So I'm also listening to um, uh, Babylon's Ashes, which is a James S.A. Corey Expanse novel. There are lots of Expanse novels and they're all very good and they all have audiobooks. And thank the Lord, they all have the same narrator because I hate it when narration changes from book to book. Uh, when it's a series. Audible carries titles in every genre you can imagine, from business to the classics, to history, to romance, to sci-fi, to kids and young adult books. It's great. So go to audible.com slash Dear John or text Dear John to 500, 500 Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring today's episode. Hank, I have to say one thing, which is about David mm. Mitchell. He wrote a book called Black Swan Green that is one of my all-time favorite mm. novels about adolescence. So if you like that David Mitchell book, I really suggest that you read Black Swan Green or listen to it. All right. Thanks. This next question, John, it comes from L, who asks, Dear Hank and John, the group of girls I've been friends with best friends with since eighth grade is planning a trip to Europe next year as a graduation celebration. My issue, I don't want to go. I love my friends and all, but I don't think I want to spend four weeks living in hostels with them, especially because it might be a stretch for me to afford due to my tendency to accept unpaid internships. The situation is further complicated by the fact that my ex-girlfriend will be along on the trip as well. On the other hand, part of me wants to go anyway so I don't miss out on these possible amazing memories. How do I tell my friends I don't want to go? Or should I just go and bear the discomfort out of a fear of missing out? In distress, L. You should go, L. Yeah, I think I think you should go. Yeah, you're going to have also, to go. I also feel that way. I think you should go, and I do think that there will be parts of it that are uncomfortable, but I also mm -hmm. think that in 10 years, you won't be able to go to Europe and mm -hmm. live in hostels for a month for a variety yeah. of reasons, one of which is that you will have developed a pretty serious aversion to body lice, but <laughs> you got to go. Uh yeah, I, was, I was thinking just, you know, the normal aches and pains of being 30, but uh, but also that. I think I think probably Elle might now have a pretty serious aversion to body lice. The good news is it's manageable. <laughs> it's true. It's not fatal, Elle, so don't worry about it. <laughs> head, to, <laughs> head to the hostels. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's such a great opportunity, and you probably don't know how fun it will be 
until you go. And it will be stressful and scary, but it will also be many other things. And the memories that you will make on that trip, I think, are really valuable. And so obviously, Hank and I don't actually know what your situation is. And it may be that you just can't bear to go and you really can't afford to go, in which case maybe don't. But I think I think you should go. Yeah, all, all all things being equal, not knowing a ton about this situation. Yeah, I I feel the same old way. All right, Hank. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of questions this week about U.S. immigration policy, and I want to mm-hmm. ask one of them. This one comes from Hulisa, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I live in McAllen, a city at the Texas-Mexico border with a Hispanic population that makes up the vast majority of the city. I'm very fortunate. I'm going to college and will be applying to medical school next summer. I had a great cultural upbringing. My parents are both of Mexican descent, and I would not have chosen to have been raised anywhere else in any way else. However, when I began hearing about the detention centers in cities at the border, I discovered much to my horror that one of the largest, if not the largest, detention center for undocumented immigrant children is in my city, actually down the street from where my sister goes to high school. It's very hard for me to watch the videos of the detention centers because the people in them are the same types of people that I see at home or college or at the grocery store. They're just people who were born half an hour away, and for trying to live that half an hour up north, they're having their families torn apart and their kids put in cells. Yet as much as I'm nauseated and deeply saddened by what is happening in my city, I feel a sense of defeat as if there's nothing, aside from volunteering and running supply drives, which I'm already taking part in, that I can do to stop this administration um, in their quest to to stop this administration in their quest for wins at politics. Any advice on how to stay optimistic and feel like my voice still matters in these dark times? French the llama, Ulysses. I really don't know. Like, I'm definitely struggling with this, but but I do want to say that um, just by writing in and giving us that perspective from a city who, from a person who lives in that city, uh, is very helpful. Like, it's it, that that is a voice that, you know, a perspective that I haven't heard a lot from. Yeah. And so that that's nice for me to have and something that like, I'm glad that you could provide for us. Yeah, it is really difficult right now. um, And I don't have any solutions. I don't know how to change our political life in the United States except by voting. And so Mm -hmm. I would really strongly encourage if you are 17 and a half and you are going to turn 18 before November, if you're 23 and you've never voted because you don't think it's important, it is important. It does matter. It matters ultimately more than all the billionaires spending all of the money trying to push policy this way or that. Like You can't let those people decide who gets to determine the future of our country. So please vote. The argument that I see on the other side of this, Hank, and I have tried to pay attention to that argument, is that we can't be a nation without borders and that somehow people Mm -hmm. on the left want us to be a nation without borders. I think that's just completely untrue. Um, I I, I think that 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 is a, a straw man argument. I haven't heard anybody say that we shouldn't have borders. There is a difference between having borders and separating families at those borders. There is a difference between having borders and denying people their uh, international right to uh, claim asylum. And the people who, people who come to this country, whether they are citizens or not, whether they are documented immigrants or not, they deserve due process under the law that mm-hmm. is guaranteed them in the Constitution. And to me, this is not a left-right issue. And I, I think it's really important, if we can, to stand up as a country and say this is not a left-right issue and refuse to accept it. And I, I don't know what else we can do other than that. I am also frustrated and scared and overwhelmed, and I am so, so sorry to the people that this directly affects because I know that yeah. I'm, I'm not one of those people. Um, but I'm only not one of those people because I won a birth lottery. Mm-hmm. And I, I came in to, 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 you know, the days before VidCon, this was all sort of happening. And as we arrived at VidCon, you were like, well, uh, Trump signed an executive order that's going to do something, I guess. And, and it just makes it like, it's sort of these additional complexities that it's like, well, what does this mean? Do, are those families going to be reunited? Have they been? What's the process through which that happens? Suddenly it becomes like you just add these little complexities until people stop paying attention. Right. And I just I feel like that's done over and over again. And it's intentional to try and make people feel like, well, I guess I'm not sure. 
I guess I'm not sure what the situation is because I'm not sure who's in the right here. Right. And Same thing is done with when it comes to gun control legislation. Things yeah. are brought up and nuances are explored. And then I do think there has been some change in the U.S.'s policy toward people coming to the United States. Um, but there are too many families that have not been reunited and it is completely unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so is the amount of just not telling the truth. It It is so difficult. It is so difficult to have conversations with people who won't engage with reality. I just don't, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. Like, I mean, you see the president over and over again saying that crime in Germany is going up and it isn't. That is a lie. Crime in Germany is going down. By the way, crime in the United States is also going down. So I, I, I would think that the president would want to take uh, credit for that. But I think what the president really wants to do is make people feel afraid. And the truth that crime in the United States is declining, as it has been for 40 years, uh, is not something that will make people afraid. And so it doesn't mm-hmm. get any doesn't get any emphasis. I've got a, one that's a little bit more light. It's from Abby, who asks, Dear Hank and John, after being a traditional academic overachiever for the last 22 years, I finally graduated college. Next year, I'm starting law school because apparently I haven't had enough school in my life yet. But for the summer, I got my dream summer job, selling popsicles for King of Pops. It's the best. I get to hang out outside and bring people the summer joy of tasty popsicles and hang out with awesome coworkers. But all my friends and family act as though my summer job is a waste of time or unimportant in the scheme of my academic career. My grandma even went so far as to ask how I'm possibly occupying my time. The thing is, I know that getting this job was the right thing for me this summer, and I'm having an awesome time. What is your dubious advice for dealing with people who think that you're wasting your time just because you aren't doing something traditionally thought of as successful? Spaghetti, squash, and seagulls, Abby. I would, anytime somebody says that to you, I would hand them a popsicle and yeah. say, <laughs> <"Fuck> off. <laughs> I love this so much, Abby. You're my favorite. I think Just it's so wonderful. Carry around a cooler at all times. And anybody, anytime somebody's like, wow, I can't believe your job the summer before you go to law school no, is selling popsicles. And you just hand them a popsicle and you say, f*** you. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, no, no, obviously you say, suck on this. No, that's way better. <laughs> <laughs> that's so much uh, better. And it doesn't have to get bleeped. It doesn't have to get bleeped. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, man, first of all, Abby, it's so important for us to have a variety of experiences in our life, not just the ones that, uh, that, that, Oh God, that carries like not just the like the shoot down which we are supposed to slide into into success. Like take a diversion, have a good time, and and also like have a job that you know isn't isn't constant pressure, isn't work and law. Like being a lawyer is gonna be hard, and time like you're gonna have to grind and work eighty hour weeks sometimes. And it is well, you gonna don't know be, what it's like to work for King of Pops. Maybe it's eighty-hour weeks. We I don't, don't know. know. You're right. You're right. Maybe it's very hard. It seems. It seems that. It seems that it's not. It seems that my my guess is that legally, King of Pops does not want you to work into overtime hours. I'm trying to find out where 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 King of Pops is open because I'm on their website right now, and it may be the best designed. I don't want to go back to criticizing uh, wedding websites, but uh, Josh. Before you finish Oof. designing your wedding web- website, let me encourage you to check out kingofpops.com because this is a fantastic website. And they got a Pops by Mail section. And I've never even heard of this company. But Abby... Not me either. I'm not just buying some Pops, although I am. I'm buying a box of Pops. I am also buying uh, a King of Pops t-shirt because they're phenomenally good t-shirts. So There's, This is so cute. I love it. It's great. There's a happy counter at the top right where you can submit a happy moment that includes includes a, a pop story yeah this and a, is good they've had stuff. 190 happy moments submitted where is king of pops Al- i want to i want to open a franchise and they're well they're committed to staying in the south and their headquarters are in atlanta uh, that's not great i'm not i'm very why far are you away committed to staying the in the south king of pops why not work with me work with me well, yeah we want to open up a king of pops joint in missoula montana which is yeah where, the where, south it's, where of montana. it's warm for literally a month 
Yeah, but people, you know what, Hank? Pe- Alaska has per capita the most ice cream consumption of any state in the union. Is that for real? No, I made it up. All but right. it could be that true. Sa- sounded like the kind of thing you made up. It but- could be true. I'll tell you what, this King of Pops website is so good. I want to buy a King of Pops. This is it, Hank. This is, we found our thing. We're not going to be the people who bring back Omegles. We're going to bring the, be the people who bring King of Pops to Missoula. That's right. I, I, I want to own, I'm going to buy a part of King of Pops. Is that an option? Who, who, who's available? Meet the team. Yeah, can I buy? Who can I call? How do I buy? How do I buy stock in this in this company? <laughs> Let's go to meet the team. Let's figure out. There's is, a lot. Of, this is a big team. Steven, are you the guy who sells me stock? Yeah, is Abby on the team page? I don't know. Let's this look is, at it. Abby, maybe you should go to law Abby, school. You're maybe not on the team page. Should, Abby, I'm not sure you should go to law school. I'm pretty sure that you should work for King of Pops for the rest <laughs> of your life. Well, you could go to law school and then become like the King of Pops. Uh, the, in-house you know, counsel. In-house counsel. Great yeah. idea, Hank. <laughs> Somebody needs to do it. They're growing fast. They are. I mean, look at all of these people who work at King of Pops. I cannot wait for the King of Pops to open in Missoula. Hank, before we get to the all-important news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon, uh, I want to read one response from Robin, who wrote in to say, Hi, John and Hank. I was shocked when I heard your discussion of bread heels on the last episode of your podcast. Lots of people are upset with me about my bread heel position. I apologize. The answer to this question is so incredibly obvious. You make the sandwich with the heel and put the crust on the inside, meaning that when you put the peanut butter on the bread, you put it on the crust part. Then you have the good bread part outside, and basically you trick your brain into thinking that you're eating a normal sandwich. It's not stealing, it's Robin. Ah, it's a great ah, idea, Robin. That, that is a, a high idea. quality idea. I think that would probably work. What if you just made a, a sandwich with the, both the heels? So you took the, both the heels, you made a sandwich with them, and then you just pretend like it's a calzone. <laughs> That's also a reasonably good idea. <laughs> Hank, what is the news from Mars this week? I think I know the news from Mars and I don't think it's great. It's not great. Uh, There is currently, uh, as of this recording on Wednesday at noon, a planet-wide dust storm. It is officially uh, surround, like it it officially goes around the whole planet. So it connected up on the other side. There are some places on the planet that are not currently inside of a dust storm, but most of the places on the planet are. And uh, and that has included for the last like two weeks the place where Opportunity Rover is. Opportunity landed on Mars in 2004 and has been continuously operational since then, though it has had moments of outage, for example, during a dust storm, I think, in 2007. Uh, that that uh, turned that sort of like shut it into low power mode for a period of time. Opportunity is powered by solar panels, so obviously uh, anything that's blocking out the sun is bad news. And Opportunity also has to have uh, part of its solar panels like operation is not just to power the rover, but to actually cr- like to power a heater that keeps the rover warmer than the surface of Mars so that all of its stuff works. So if opportunity gets too cold, it will its batteries will not be able to recharge. It will not turn back on. And that will be the end of the opportunity mission. To be clear, over 5,000 days on Mars is a lot more than we were expecting to get out of this thing anyway. So it's been a remarkable mission with a lot of scientific achievement. And if this is how it goes out, then that is how it goes out. But there is hope still that it will make it through this dust storm. It's just been a very long storm. And opportunity has been in, in like its sort of fault mode where the only thing that the battery is powering is the internal clock mm. uh, so that it doesn't lose mission time. Mm-hmm. Nothing else is on. So it, you know, they are completely out of touch with opportunity right now. And they're just going to have to wait. And when this, uh, when this dust storm ends and then, and then the storm will end. And then after a while, all the dust particles will fall out of the atmosphere. Those are two separate things. And then you might also have to wait for a, a clean wind to come and blow the dust off the solar panels before we know for sure whether opportunity is going to come back and say hi again. Well, it will certainly be a sad day whenever that day comes um, that we lose uh, the opportunity rover. But it is an incredible story. I mean, it's incredible that it's been there for 15 years. It's just it's phenomenal. So hopefully there's some joy in that. But it is a very uh, sad day if this dust storm proves to be the end of uh, proves to be the end of our, our time with opportunity. Yes. And John, how's AFC Wimbledon stuff? You got any new players? 
Got any big, big infusions of cash? We've not had a major infusion of cash. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, certain uh, American young adult novelists are uh, increasing their sponsorship <laughs> next season. <laughs> that that's seems good. to have that's been good. our. That's a good piece of news. <laughs> that seems to have been our primary infusion of cash so, so far, as uh, that I can see anyway. Uh, there has been a, a quite a bit of news. The the biggest news, the headline is that Lyle Taylor, the great Lyle Taylor, the Montserratian Messi, uh, the, the legend who scored in the League Two playoff final to help send Wimbledon into League One, who uh, had so many important goals for us last season to keep us in League One, he is moving on. Uh, he has signed mm. for Charlton Athletic. Uh, it's disappointing because Charlton are also a League One uh, side. Uh, and I would have liked to see Lyle move on um, into the uh, the second tier of English football if he was going to move on from Wimbledon. That's not how it happened. I mean, they certainly have a much higher budget than Wimbledon does. I'm sure that, you know, and obviously, you know, you got to take care of yourself during the few years that you have as a professional footballer. He wrote a very nice letter on Instagram uh, in which he said it's been the best three years of my career to date uh, and talked about some of both the highs and the lows and says it's been a real honor to play for Wimbledon to wear the shirt and to help in this last chapter of this unique club story. Um, And I wish everyone associated with the club the best for the future. Still a huge bummer. There's no getting around it. I have to say, though, personally, I am so grateful to Lyle Taylor. He was always kind to me, incredibly kind to Henry when we uh, came and watched a game together. um, And is just just a wonderful person and obviously did so much for Wimbledon the last three seasons. And I wish him all the best at Charlton. We have gotten some new players. Uh, we also should should say that we lost Darius Charles as well. Great central defender moving on to Wickham, which is worrisome. But uh, we have just signed in the last few hours a goalkeeper mm. on loan from Millwall. We've had a lot of successful on-loan signings from Millwall over the years, so I'm hopeful here. His name is Tom King, and uh, that's good. He has a good last name from the perspective of, you know, like he could be the king of Wimbledon's right. goal. That's promising. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He wears number 13, so he's not a uh, person who's afraid of... <laughs> Super, not he's, a, not, he's not, not a, a superstitious, superstitious man, man, which I think is a good sign. <laughs> yep. And he is a goalkeeper. Unfortunately, this likely means that we are not going to have George Long next season. I assume we would not be signing uh, Tom King if we were going to have George Long. So mm-hmm. that's another play we're going to have to say goodbye to. But, Hank, I have to get to two important signings that we have made, or th- Three important signings, actually, uh, just in the last few days. Yesterday, we signed a new striker. He's 30 years old. His name is James Hansen, and he has scored so many goals against AFC Wimbledon. Like, every time he plays us, no matter who he's playing for, he scores. So, hopefully, uh, (laughs) he's going to keep his good goal-scoring form now that he's playing for us. Um, He is a big guy. He's a target man. We haven't had one of those in a while, so I'm excited that we've got one. Uh, I don't know what a target man is. You know, like usually Wimbledon, in the when they've been most successful, they've had a big person and a small person up front, like Lyle Taylor, fast. Tom Elliott, mm. huge. Uh, Ottawa mm. and Fenwa, huge. Lyle Taylor, fast, etc. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm hopeful for James Hansen, and then we've also signed. Um, I think almost just as important, we've got John Meads under a new contract. He's been a left back. He can also play in midfield. He's really good. I like I like him a lot, and I think he's a big part of the reason we stayed up last season. So I'm feeling good about that as well. So on the whole, we've lost some players. We've gained some players. I mean, but the big story is Lyle Taylor. What a, what a legend he's been for Wimbledon, and uh, he will long be remembered in Wimbledon lore. John, before we get to our phrases of the week, did you do your phrase of the week? I did. Ah, oh, shoot. That's terrible news. There we have a Project for Awesome message from Heather Erfath Azam to Drina. Drina, 
You are legitimately one of the kindest people I've ever met. I mispronounced your name for a year because you didn't want to make me feel bad by telling me I was getting it wrong. You literally accepted a new name to be nice. I love you the same no matter what name I may still accidentally call you, Driana. And I'm grateful for your unending patience. Oh, thank you for donating to the Project for Awesome and using it to spread love. That's Indeed. great. Hank. Oh, gosh. Was your phrase of the week shirk? No. Oh, what no, was it? No, that, act, that just popped out. Not sure where that came from. What was it? It was Ultimate Frisbee Extravaganza. Wow, you really did a good job sneaking that in. I wouldn't have gotten that in 100 years. Do you know what mine was? Mine was is really hard to guess. Uh, I have no idea. King of Pops. Uh, no, I wish. Uh, it was Gryffindor. Just Gryffindor, the one word? It was the word Gryffin space door, but I decided to interpret it loosely. <laughs> and so uh, thank you to Phoebe for donating uh, Gryffin door. Uh, and Hank, who donated your phrase of the week? Thank you to Grace and Scott for donating my phrase of the week. And indeed, thanks to everybody who donated to the Project for Awesome this year. Uh, it meant so much to us, and we're excited for next year's P4A. Hank, what did we learn today? Uh, I literally just learned that King of Pops was founded by two brothers. Oh, wow. And yeah. I also learned uh, that there is a planet-wide dust storm on Mars, which makes it seem like a great place to visit. I learned what a target man is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do only things we learned in the last five minutes. <laughs> and lastly, I learned that the Opportunity Rover has been on Mars for more than 5,000 days. <laughs> Good job. We learned so many things, John. Just thanks for uh, hanging out and making a podcast with me. Uh, and thanks to everybody for listening. If you want to email us, you can send your quest questions to hankandjohn at gmail.com. Thank you to everybody who sends in questions. Because uh, what would we do without you except go through all of our old podcast notes and pull out the ones that we didn't answer and we probably pull out the wrong ones because I can't remember anything that happened more than five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't make any sense, but thanks for potting with me. <laughs> this podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. It's produced by Rosian Hals Rojas and Sheridan Gibson. Our head of community and communications is Victoria Bongiorno. The music that you are listening to right now and at the beginning of the podcast is by the great Gunnarola. We are now off to make our Patreon-only podcast this week in Ryan's. It's terrible. You should listen to it. Patreon.com slash Dear Hank and John. Thank you again for listening. And as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to be awesome. awesome.